Hello, everyone. I have the honor of introducing um, your second 2017 AAC keynote speaker, Mrs. Atia Abawi. Um, Atia John is incredibly accomplished and has an extensive background, so I want to give you a few of the highlights to give her some justice um, about everything she's done. Um, she started off as a CNN foreign correspondent at the International Desk, where she covered things like Benazir Bhutto's assassination, the war in Iraq. Uh, she snuck in and covertly recorded the trials in Myanmar. She traveled with NATO and Afghan forces on active military zones. She interviewed um, Afghan and American politicians and generals in Afghanistan. And then NBC got smart and decided to snatch her away from CNN. <laughs> so in 2010, she was NBC's um, correspondent where she headed the operations in Afghanistan for all reporting. And she was able to capture an exclusive interview with Hamid Karzai, which was the first that the network had in a decade. Which goes to prove, if you want anything done, send in an Afghan woman. <laughs> After five years of living and reporting in Afghanistan, she moved to Jerusalem, where she covered President Obama's historic trip to Israel and Palestine. She covered the coup in Egypt and the Kenyan Mall siege. Now, needless to say, she has hustle, <laughs> okay? But it's her heart that has brought her here to AAC. She is your keynote speaker because she embodies and embraces the vision and mission of AAC, which is to engage, empower, and support. She is engaged with the community. She has connected all of us who have left the homeland by reporting on the stories back in Afghanistan. But not only us, but the world. Being able to properly pronounce the regions even on a broadcast is refreshing to see. And she's empowered. She's a Muslim Afghan woman covering foreign correspondent on active military zones. She's reaching out for conflict. She's in the conflict zones. She has seen some conflict, even more than the Mantu Oshak debate we have on Facebook. <laughs> Believe it or not, there's more conflicts out there. And she is supportive. She flew directly from Jerusalem to be here for this conference and only for this conference to address you here today. But she's not here to just give you a speech. She's also serving on our professional panel where she's mentoring future journalists, Afghan journalists. She's also partaking in the cohorts, cohorts. In fact, she was the first person to respond in the email and introduce herself to get to know everyone. And I am ashamed to say, this morning, she went and bought me coffee and asked me how I was doing. Bashar me them. My mom would kill me. So, needless to say, she's doing it all. Rock, paper, scissors, and all. And that's what's amazing about AEC. That's what drives me here. As you've apparently heard my whole background, I was running away from Afghans, but why am I here today? It's because of amazing and humble people like her and our TED Talk speakers that are coming together to talk about our community and they're passionate about it. You will be hard pressed to find any other conference where you're talking about post-Trump organizing for Afghans, mental health and depression, addiction, poetry, the history of Afghanistan, homophobia, all in one conference with Afghans who are passionate about it? That's amazing. Where else are you gonna find that? That's what I love about AAC. It's customized for me. And selfishly, I personally wanted Atia John as our keynote because I'm a little bit of a fangirl and I've Google stalked her, admittedly. And I wanted her to address our community in Washington, D.C., miles from the White House, in a room filled with 400 Afghans at a conference dedicated for our community. That's what I wanted. As she'll be here today addressing you, just realize she didn't have someone addressing her when she started her career. And we do. What are our kids gonna have? So please, I hope you can capitalize on this conference, soak it in, 
and soak in everything she has to offer and join me in welcoming Atiya John. Wow, so just so you know, she made me look a lot more amazing than I am because I'm not that amazing. Um, first of all, I'm very excited to be here. This is just the most incredible uh, conference to have and something that I'm just so proud of our community for doing. So a shout out to all the volunteers, everyone, the founders, everyone who made this happen. So thank you for that. Um, So I want to start by asking you guys a question. Who here feels like they belong anywhere? Put your hand up. Who feels at times that they don't belong? That's, that's what I thought. Um, in today's world, it's even harder. It was hard from when we started. Um, the big question is, am I Afghan or am I an American? Um, I don't have the clicker. Do I need a clicker? Is this it? OK. Yeah, here we go. There we go. Um, we're called dual citizens. We're citizens of Afghanistan. We're citizens of America. What I call us is dual foreigners. Never fully accepted here and never fully accepted there. I lived there for four and a half years. Some people welcomed me with open arms. Some people shunned me because they said, who are you? You grew up somewhere else. You're not one of us. I literally had someone I was interviewing saying, you don't know what it's like. And he's absolutely right to say that. But then he started, I should say, dogging the Afghan diaspora for leaving. A month later, he went somewhere for assignment and asked for asylum after making fun of my family and I, which really hurt. But then there was another Afghan there who said, don't listen to him, you are one of us. But we're, we're, what it really is, is we are the dual foreigner. Um, can we be both without contradiction? What if you add other things? You're a male, you're a female, um, your sexual orientation. I mean, it becomes harder and harder um, the more elements that you throw in it. I feel like I've tried and I've started to figure it out for myself. I'm still figuring it out, but as I got older, you guys are really young and make me feel really old, um, it became a little bit more clear. I have designations I've given myself, and I have had designations that have been given to me. I mean, I think every Afghan female has been labeled that for what you've worn, who you've talked to, um, what kind of music you listen to. I mean, in Afghanistan, I wasn't male or female. I was, I was an, an Afghan-American woman. So it didn't designate me as, I guess there's a third sex there for Western women. But I was in between the third sex and female. The third sex was untouchable, but I still had the Afghan side, so I was approachable, and I will explain that a little bit later on. My background's just like all of your background, basically, for the most part, at least. Uh, I was born a refugee. My mom was eight months pregnant with me when they escaped. My brother was two. A month later, I was born in Germany, and then we came to America when I was one. I'm not going to go into this, because we all have the same story. In fact, that's my... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's my refugee, actually, picture. Like, that's my, actually, it says the refugee immigration card from Germany. Resident alien. We, we, we know what it's about. Luckily for us, it was our parents that struggled to make our lives better, to give us what they had to leave behind and they couldn't get back when they came here like we're doing right now. So when I was asked to give this keynote address, I was told to be personal, vulnerable, um, and there was one more. But, <laughs> but basically, I had to designate it in different things to remind me what to say, because it made me even more nervous. Because as a journalist, you can't get personal. You can't get vulnerable. Ah, the last one was political. 
I can't share my politics as a journalist, but I'm not here as a journalist. So growing up, it was hard. Elementary school, people didn't know what Afghanistan was. So they'd say, where are you from? I'd say, Afghanistan. They're like, Africa? I'm like, no, Afghanistan. But I was born in West Germany. You're a communist. Like, no, my parents escaped the communists. It's like, oh my god, I'm never going to win on this. <laughs> but luckily, I grew up here in Northern Virginia, where it's really diverse. My best friend in grade school was a Cambodian refugee. Um, and we have, obviously, a lot of Afghans. The high school I went to had 129 different nations and 74 different languages when I was there. But at the same time, we had the Afghans, and my nickname was Dukhtara Safed, white girl because I played sports and all that. And like many of you, sometimes I didn't feel really accepted by the Afghan community. I was into different things. I wanted to play tennis. Um, I wanted to do those things that I guess the Dukhtar Safeds would do. I'd walk down the hall and be like, Salam Dukhtar Safed. And it got to the point where I was like, Salam. <laughs> but it is what it is. I still had my Afghan friends. We had fun about it. I went to Saturday school, all of that. Um, my parents, like many of yours, probably thought we were going to go back. They wanted me to know the language, and they, they wanted me to know how to read and write it so I could be prepared. I thought it was a waste of time. I knew we weren't going back. Um, but I'm glad they did that, because it became very useful for when I did go to Afghanistan. I want to share a story about following your dreams, because this is something that I feel like, in our community, we have a problem doing because we want to make our parents proud. We want to make our community proud. We've been brought up with this, this idea that we have a reputation to uphold. And your dreams don't really count when it's not going to be the typical type of su success, um, which is something that is really hard to do, let's be honest. How many of us can go to school to be a doctor for so long? <laughs> I couldn't handle it. I have mad respect for that. Um, but for me, I knew from a very young age that I wanted to be a journalist. In fact, I was seven years old when I started writing and scribbling little things. Um, we watched the news every single night to see what was going on in Afghanistan. We were trying to have a connection to the homeland, and I wanted to do that. I wanted to see what was going on. I didn't trust journalists very much. So I wanted to be the one to go see it with my own eyes and share the story. And this was at a time where news was a little bit more objective. In today's day and age, there's a lot more opinionated channels. The 24-hour network, you have a political leaning, you pick a channel. So in high school, I had the opportunity to take a journalism class. Journalism one in 10th grade. I had a teacher. I took it. I was excited. Got good grades. Uh, Second year, junior year, I took photojournalism. I loved photography. I wanted to do that aspect, make the yearbook, uh, kind of see what it's like to work on a magazine by working on the yearbook. Third year, senior year, final year, AP journalism. Again, got decent grades, did all the work, got my assignments done. Not much criticism, so I thought, great. My teacher at the time was one of the most well-respected journalism teachers in the country. The school newspaper was well known nationally. He was basically someone that people talked about. The last day of class, he put on Citizen Kane. This is before basically we're all leaving high school and going on to colleges. I got into my school. I picked my major. I was excited. One by one, he called everyone to his desk and said, what do you want to do when you grow up? How is journalism going to relate to your life? For me, he said, you took three years of it. What do you want from this? And I told him, I was so excited. I got in my major. I got in my school. I was like, well, I want to be a foreign correspondent. I want to go overseas. I want to tell the stories. Stop right there. He put his finger up. He goes, you're never going to make it. You don't have it in you. Don't even bother trying because you're wasting your time. As a 17-year-old, I was crushed. It's one thing to hear it from your parents, and you're like, well, they're Afghan. They don't want me to follow my dreams. <laughs> and, but you're taught in school, like, teachers, they know. They're the ones who support you. They're going to push you. They want you to follow your dreams. 
This guy crushed it in a second. I left his desk going back to my desk, just thoughts going through my head. I already declared my major. They said it's so impossible to change your major. How am I going to do this? What am I going to do? And for months, that kept going through my head through the summer before college. Like, how do I approach the school to change my major? You know, my mom already said that as a woman, as a Muslim, um, it's going to be hard. And then, of course, I get the crushing blow, and suddenly my parents are like, oh, Buko, it's, you know, we're, we're on your side now. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> I was like, now I need to change it. <laughs> but, and some of you on the panel yesterday heard this already, there's a point in your life when you have dreams and you've shared your dreams. And those dreams become the dreams of those who are supporting you. So what kept me going was my parents, because it was no longer just my dream, it was theirs. And I'm glad I stuck to it. And I'm telling you right now, if I could do what I put my mind to, anyone else can do that as well. So don't ever let anyone tell you that it's impossible. Because when you start thinking it's impossible, that's when it becomes impossible. Um, and also, he was a bully. There are going to be so many more bullies that you meet along the way. I had them at CNN. I had management who hated the fact that I was on air. They didn't want an Afghan Muslim girl on air. Um, and they did everything in their power to downplay me. It got to a point where my dream became a nightmare. So I said, I'm out. When my contract ended, I said, I'm not resigning. And I then thought, oh my god, what am I going to do now? <laughs> Luckily, God was on my side. Like my mom said, your connection's God. It might not be, you might not know anyone who works in the business, but your connection's God. And if you don't believe in God, your connection is your spirituality and your belief in yourself. Um, and it's never too late to keep changing. I went from a journalist to being an author, two things that I never thought I could succeed at. I'm hoping if you read the book, you like it. Some people might think that I didn't succeed at that either. <laughs> I want to go into vulnerability really fast. Um, I know we don't have much time, so I want to talk about being a woman. I'm going to go into being a woman, the difficulties you have here, and then the difficulties that I've had in Afghanistan. I'm going to touch on the ones I had in Afghanistan. Your words have immense power. They really do. So you have to be very careful of what you say, Ghaibat, gossip. When you talk about someone you don't know that well, it affects them. And I'll share a story about, in Afghanistan, I, when I was going to NBC, I was so excited. But a female producer in London warned me. She said, that man that you're working with doesn't like working for females. I was like, but he's my friend. You know, we get along. When I was at CNN, I was like, no, nah, it's fine. But she was absolutely right. He tried to sabotage me every step of the way. When the big anchor, Lester Holt, came, he tried to sabotage the story that I had gotten ready. And I didn't think it was him. But then someone told me it was him. So I approached him. And I said, why did you do that? I thought we were friends. And he just started cursing at me. So it was an unpleasant work environment. But I said, you know what, whatever. His life is hard. He needs a salary. I'm not going to tattle on him. I'm just going to work hard. I did it by myself at CNN. I could do it by myself at NBC. Then I noticed stares and talks and whatnot. And I've, I, have, I had it before. There's so many guys there that I apparently was a girlfriend to, and I had no idea. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then goes back to that first label I was given. Um, but then it got serious. I was at a press conference, and it was a President Karzai's press conference. Before you come into the palace, you have to be there like three hours early. Um, so they were giving us kebab, you know, um, and I'm noticing all the local Afghan journalists that I was friends with were kind of giving me the side eye. She's like, what's going on? I was like, okay, whatever. I didn't think much of it. Then the press conference is about to start. All the journalists sit down. Everyone's told to get quiet because President Karzai and Vice President Biden were coming in. At that moment, a friend of mine, a producer from Al Jazeera, English, turned to me and said, and for C, but I'll say it in English just because I know not everyone speaks for C. 
at Tiajan, no matter what anyone says about you. And then he turned and looked straight at my producer, and he goes, and I mean anyone. He goes, just know that we love you. That man, Kais, he had more respect than the other producer. So I went from being this horrible, disgusting person back to being, OK, that's the same Atia, who's our friend. So then what he did, about a week later, the CBS correspondent who lived in the house with me, a Canadian woman, came up and she said, my local Afghan cameraman says that you need to be careful. And I said, why? And she said, our guards are planning to attack you. I said, what? I got our British security guards. I told, her what she, told them what she said. They did an investigation. They told me that he was trying to get me gang raped to get me out of Afghanistan. So this is my point about gossip. Like, be careful, especially when it comes to the women, whether it's in our community or outside of our community. Go a little bit into beliefs. You know, I'm assuming most people here are Muslim. <laughs> Um, but not everyone is. I am. I believe in it. I've studied it. I believe in my own interpretation. I don't like it when other people tell me to do things their way because I went out of my way to read the Quran Sharif to know what my beliefs are. I married a Christian. In fact, there's the imam and the priest side by side. Thank you. Oops. Did I end it? OK, it's fine. Um, but my point isn't like, yeah, I'm married a Christian. No, <laughs> that's not my point. I met him in Afghanistan. In fact, I was telling everyone yesterday, too, he's read more books about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, than I have. And I've read some. Because he goes out of his way to make sure that when people attack anyone, and this is the way he was raised as a Catholic, that it's wrong. He's lived in Afghanistan. He's lived in the Middle East. He works for Fox News. <laughs> he was called the Antichrist by a Fox News watcher because he works for Fox and married me. Um, but basically what I'm saying is, in my version of Islam, of my understanding is we all have different understandings. And let's not mock each other or say that you're wrong. Let's not push each other away from what they believe in, whether they're Jewish, Catholic, Buddhist, atheist. Because in what I understand from what I read is God chooses who goes to heaven. So, and we're not supposed to judge. God's the final judge. Um, anyway, that was hard to explain to my parents. <laughs> Not that hard, I should say. It was harder to explain to my dad. My mom, I told her right away, I think it's a sin to ask someone to convert from what I've read in the Quran Sharif, but I don't think it's a sin for me to marry him. Right away, she said, OK. My dad said, just ask him. <laughs> <laughs> so I told my dad, I was just like, no, this is, he's like, Avonachi Megan, what are the Afghans going to say about this? I was like, what's God going to say about this if I'm right about me thinking this is a sin and that's not? And then I, I found Imam Hindi and like he said, no, you're absolutely right. This is, this is right. And, la, da, 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 da. and one, once he heard it from Imam Hindi, he was like, okay. <laughs> um, on a final note, this is amazing. We're together. We need to be together. We need to be stronger together. Um, not to quote Hillary Clinton, but I am. But stronger together is their slogan. But I, I'm, it's a good slogan to have. We need to help other communities as well. If we want to be strong, if we want to step up, we can't do it alone. And we have to help others who need that help too. Those that are being persecuted, whether they be 
the African American community here who have gone through so much and continue to, they can't hide under blonde highlights sometimes. Um, the refugees that are coming now, there are millions of people who continue to suffer. And we can't just say, well, I'm here. I mean, mm. we need to step up, voice up. You don't have to volunteer time if you don't have time. If someone makes a crude joke, you say, no, that's wrong. If someone even makes like a slight remark, just say, no, you're wrong. And women, LGBT community, like, we have to just come together and be that force that makes that change because there is another group out there that's becoming stronger and stronger day by day through their own frustrations. Yes, we should understand what they're thinking, but don't just sit back and be like, well, you know, do your own thing, say your own words, express it, whether it be in a slight way or a strong way. You know, but you know yourselves better than I know you. Um, but let's just not forget the people around us, and then once we work with them, they work with us, and then we create something absolutely beautiful, which is stay woke. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.